Uh, Daniel chapter 1, and we're only looking at verses 1 to 2 this evening, just sort of an introduction to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. I trust that God will bless to us the reading of his perfect word this evening. Well, it's great this evening to be starting a series in the book of Daniel. Not sure if we'll make it all the way through, but I certainly hope so. Um, on Sunday mornings, we've been looking together at John's Gospel, uh, spending a lot of time in the New Testament together. Uh, so I thought it'd be helpful on these Thursday nights to go back to the Old Testament and to spend some of our times in those writings, uh, writings which are just as full of grace and truth as those in the New Testament. Now, you might be thinking this evening, what's the point of studying the book of Daniel? How can the story of God's people in exile all those years ago instruct us here in Gisborne in 2023? How can the struggles of men with funny names like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, how can these guys help us in our modern age with all its unique trials and tribulations? Why should we study a book which is thousands of years old all these years later? Well, the simplest answer to that question is because it's the word of God. Uh, Because all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be fully equipped and ready for every good work. But we never need an excuse to look at any book of the Bible in church, even these ancient writings. It's all profitable for us. Now, as we look at the book of Daniel, it's not just a history book. It's a book which shows you his story. Uh, The story of the sovereign God, the story of the God who causes kingdoms to rise and fall, the one who wounds but also heals, the one whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and whose kingdom shall never be destroyed. It focuses on the sovereignty of God. It's a book which points us to the person and work of Christ with types, shadows and symbols. Uh, But not only is it a book about God, it's a very practical book as well. It's an immensely practical book which instructs us how to live in this world. You see, we actually have much more in common with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego than you might first realize. You see, just as the children of Israel were strangers living under a foreign power in an environment of hostility and challenge, we too as Christian people, as God's people, we are exiles in this world. We are, as the Bible puts it, aliens, pilgrims, and strangers. We don't belong here anymore if we're Christians. As the old hymn says, heaven is our home, we're just a passing through. And so the book of Daniel, it tells us how to live in that in-between time, when the kingdom is already but not yet, as we face trials and tribulations and a hostile state which hates Christianity and the Christian God. So this book shows us how to live in the world, but not be of the world. In the world, but not of it. It's essential reading for every Christian, and it's just as timely as when it was written. So that's a super brief introduction as to why you should read the book of Daniel. But now we turn to the book's own introduction, uh, to verses 1 and 2. And there's going to be some names and some dates and that kind of thing. We have to do a little bit of digging initially just to get our head in the game, just to understand what's going on. But I trust that it'll bless us as it is the word of God. Now, these two little verses reveal to you two different perspectives, two different ways of seeing the world. We'll see firstly, this will be my first point, the history of the exile, what was happening in Israel and Babylon, From a human perspective, who were the people, who were the players in this great drama? And secondly, and far more importantly, we'll see things from God's perspective. We'll see the theology of the exile. What does God say happened when his people were carried off into Babylon? How does the struggle we see between Israel and Babylon point to a greater cosmic conflict which goes on in this world? 
and will only end at the return of Christ. So there's all that in just these two little verses. But let's look together firstly then at the history of the exile. The history of the exile. Now as we arrive in Daniel chapter 1 with, with Daniel and his friends in the kingdom of Babylon, um, held captive by, by King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, it's important that we understand how all this happened, how these things came to be. You see, things had not been going well in Israel. It's a recurring theme over and over again. Rebellion, repentance, revival. Rebellion, repentance, revival. And they were in a season of rebellion. The glory days of Solomon had gone, and people had turned their back on the God of Israel. The kingdom had split into two. The northern kingdom went their way. The southern kingdom went their way. And both of them went away from God. It was a terrible time in Israel's history. And although the temple was still functioning, although it still looked the part, the sacrifices were empty religious rituals. God hated what was going on. He warned his people in the prophet Isaiah, he said these words. He said, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates them. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So the people of God, they were meeting together for worship and God was grieved by it. So far was their heart away from the realities of heaven. And worse than that, the children of Israel had begun to worship idols. Even in the temple, there were idols popping up. The priests were leading the people astray. They were worshipping gods which had mouths but couldn't speak, eyes eyes but couldn't see, and feet but couldn't walk. It was a terrible time in Israel's history. And they had forgotten what God had warned them. You see, God was gracious to his people. He gave them a fair warning. Let me read you one of those warnings from the book of Leviticus. God had told them everything which would happen if they didn't listen to his word. Leviticus 26 says, If you will not listen to me but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. And I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your incense altars, and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols. And my soul will abhor you. I will lay your cities waste, and make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your pleasing aromas. And I myself will devastate the land, so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations and unsheathe the sword upon you. Well, those are hard words, aren't they, from God? That's a very serious one. And if I'd read that one, then I'd like to think I'd have liked to try and avoid it. I'd have thought, I don't want to eat the flesh of my own children. I don't want to be scattered among the nations. I don't want to have a hook put in my nose and dragged off to serve under a foreign power but they didn't pay attention. It was the northern kingdom which fell first. The northern kingdom fell first. Uh, The Assyrian armies invaded in in 740, and over the next 20 years, they chipped away at the northern kingdoms, at the 10 tribes, and they took them away into exile. The rest of them were scattered, killed by wild animals in the desert. There was only a small remnant left in the northern kingdom. It was a terrible act of judgment. You can read all about it in 2 Kings chapter 17. Now at this point, the southern kingdom of Judah hadn't been brought into exile. It wasn't the Assyrians who would take them away, it would be the Babylonians. You see, God was gracious to Judah. They hadn't been as bad as the northern kingdom, so God gave them some space to repent. He gave them time. He let them see the destruction of the north so that they might turn to him in repentance. But instead of humbling themselves, their hearts just got harder. They remained proud and stubborn. They carried on worshipping false gods and idols and eventually God had had enough. God, true to his word, came in judgment against the southern kingdom of Judah. And it's here where we pick up our account in verse 1. I'll read it to us. In the third, third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem in three stages. 
If you read your Bible, you'll get confused if you don't quite piece it together properly. The first siege took place in the year 607, and Nebuchadnezzar went in and he stole all the high-ranking officials. Anyone who was important, he said, you're coming with me to Babylon. And this is when Daniel was carried away. He was an important young man. They could see his potential. And shortly after that, he came again and he, he gathered up more people, including the prophet Ezekiel. And finally, he came and destroyed the temple and took whoever was left into Babylon. It was a reign of terror which lasted for years and years. Begins in 607, ends in 586. True to his word, true to what God had promised, he let his temple be destroyed. He took away the, the idols, he took away the sanctuary, he took away everything. Just as he'd promised hundreds of years before, thousands of years before in the book of Leviticus. Now as you look at this from a purely human perspective, of course it's true history, isn't it? These are events which actually happened. And there are many historians who offered their theories about why this happened. For example, some historians say, oh, it's because Israel had a terrible king at this time. He was weak. He was no David. He didn't show his military power. He was weak and the nations knew he was weak, so they were able to capture the Israelites. That's one human explanation offered to you by the world. Again, the military commanders, they looked at the situation and they said, a kingdom divided is weaker. If they'd have just stayed united, they'd have been able to withstand Nebuchadnezzar and destroy him. These are all the different texts that historians give on these things. And but at the end of the day, it's just human wisdom, isn't it? It's just their opinion of what happened. It's the blind leading the blind. They're trying to make sense of it with worldly thinking. If you want to get God's perspective on what happened on the exile, you're going to have to read God's book. And it's the book to which all other books bow down. History bows down to the Bible, not the other way around. This is the true history of our world. And we need to see things from God's perspective. And so we've looked at the history of the exile. We've seen the dates and the names. You don't have to remember all that. It'll get mentioned again and again as we go through the book. We've seen it from a human perspective. But now let's look at it from God's perspective. Why does God say his people went into exile? And we've seen the history of the exile, now let's look together at the theology of the exile. Well, the books describe the events in simple human terms. It's given as the facts about what happened. And these same, same facts, you can find them in the Britannica encyclopedias. You don't need divine revelation um, to know what I've just told you, to tell you the names and the dates. But in verse 2, it zones in on God's perspective. We see spiritually why these things came to pass. And at the end of the day, that's the only perspective that really matters. Now, as you look at verses 1 and 2, take note of what we see in verse 2. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the vessels of the house of God. It's now that you begin to get a fuller picture of what really happened. It wasn't a bad day on the military field for Israel. It wasn't just time and chance and Nebuchadnezzar had a better run than they did. The reason they were handed over into Nebuchadnezzar's hands is because the Lord gave them over. He gave them over. He decreed it. It was his sovereign pleasure. He is the one who's let his people be plundered. Now as Daniel writes this, we know that Daniel's a prophet, but you don't have to be a prophet to know this. If you read your Bible carefully, you'll see everything that happened was the fulfillment of what God had said in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. All the promises, all the threats he promised are now coming to pass under his sovereign hand. Now, if you've been at Grace for a little while, you'll notice that we often stress God's sovereignty. We often stress the teaching of the sovereignty of God. Now, that's not because it's a pet doctrine of ours or a hobby horse. It's because it's something which we need to focus on in these days more than ever before. And with all the chaos going on in the world, 
We need to be reminded who's really in control. The one who turns people's hearts to do his will. The one who raises up kingdoms and destroys kingdoms. So you can look at it from a human perspective and say, yeah, it was a bad day for, for Israel. Or you can see it from God's perspective, that he's sovereignly working all things together for good. And we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Because if you're in the church, if you're in God's kingdom, you'll know often it looks like the wheels are falling off, doesn't it? It looks like everything's coming undone in this kingdom. Sometimes it looks as if the church is more zealous for God's glory than he is. Sometimes it looks like things are going chaotic, things are going bad, um, and, the, and the enemy is having victory. Think of Nebuchadnezzar. He was probably congratulating himself on a job well done. He thinks, yes, I've beaten the Israelites and their so-called God. And he takes the silver cups, he takes the spoils of war, he takes them back to Babylon, he's praising his false gods and he offers them up to the false gods in his temple and he's so happy with what he's done. But he doesn't realise that God is in control. He doesn't realise that those same silver cups, his son will drink out of them on the night that he dies when God overthrows Babylon. That his son will be praising the false gods with those same cups in his hand and be destroyed moments later. God is in control. Time has a way of revealing all things. In time, Nebuchadnezzar himself is going to be terribly humbled. He's going to be sent out into the field. His mind is going to be taken from him. God's going to take away his faculties of thinking. And he's going to be like a wild animal eating grass for seven years just because the God of heaven says so, because he blasphemed the God of heaven. He will be humbled. He will praise the God of heaven. God has a greater plan than what we see going on. He will confess that God is the true king. He will use words which kind of summarize the whole book of Daniel for us. He will confess that God is the king who has an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are as counted as nothing before him. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. That's what Nebuchadnezzar will come to see in time. God has a purpose. God has a plan, even when it looks like things are going terribly. So we mustn't look at, at the history of our world and just see history, just see events History is his story. It's the story of the sovereign God and what he does in our world. We must never slip into that way of thinking that God's like a clockmaker. You know, he winds up the clock and he sets it going and then he leaves it to tick away, not knowing what's going to happen. No, the vision scripture gives us is that God holds up this world by the word of his power. That if Jesus Christ stopped speaking to this world, it would fly off into outer space and we'd all, be, we'd all be rubble and dust. He upholds my heart, your heart, our eyes, everything by the word of his power. He's not abandoned us like the clockmaker. He's in charge of everything. The sovereignty of God something we're going to see again and again and again in the book of Daniel. Now another danger we face as we look at this story is that we see the conflict, we see everything going on between Babylon and Israel, and we just look at it with human eyes. We get caught up in Nebuchadnezzar, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah, all these names and events and places, and we forget that behind this is a cosmic struggle, that there's a great cosmic battle being played out as Israel is taken captive in Babylon. There's a great heavenly struggle being pointed to. What do I mean by this, you might be saying? Let's just take a step back for a second from this passage. Take a bit of a bird's eye view of Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now in these two little verses, you're introduced to two cities. Two very different places. There's Jerusalem, which is the great city of God. It's where God dwells with his people. It's a glorious place. And then on the other hand, you've got Babylon. It's not the city of God, it's the city of men. The city of sin is the absolute opposite to Jerusalem. And these two kingdoms are in eternal opposition to one another. 
Uh, just in case you've not quite pieced it together, Babylon is Babel from the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 11. When we talk about Babylon, it's Babel, they're the same place, different time. It's the place where man sought to build a stairway to heaven. When they said, we don't need God's help to get to heaven, we can do it ourselves. It's the place where all human religion began. Every wicked religion, every, every false god you see can be traced back to Babel, back to Babylon. It's a city of sin, a city of self-achievement, a city of um, self-worship, a city which is filthy compared to Jerusalem. It's a city where God's people are not welcome and where God's people don't want to be. Now this conflict, it actually goes even further back to the Garden of Eden. When our God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. When God said that, when he cursed the serpent and he blessed his people, he divided humanity into two families. In this world, there's not loads of different whanos and families, there's just two. There's the people of God and the people of the wicked one. This is what you see in the scriptures. And since that moment, since this division in the Garden of Eden, they haven't been able to dwell together in peace. They haven't been able to exist alongside one another because light cannot exist in darkness and darkness cannot exist in the light. So these two kingdoms are in eternal opposition to one another. So when we stand back and we look at the whole story of the Bible, and we hear that the king of Jerusalem has been captured by the king of Babylon, this isn't good news. This is not what we want in God's story. This is not how we expect history to unfold. Because it looks as if sinners won the day. It looks as if God's lost his people. It looks as if everything has gone wrong. It looks as though the city of God and the people of God are going to be swallowed up by evil. Uh, but we know the end from the beginning, don't we? We know that God's kingdom will triumph and that even in this wickedness, there will be salvation. Now, there's some principles to bring forward to our day here. And we must remember that in our evil culture, in our secular humanist culture, which um, murders infants, which um, promotes transgender issues, which does all these strange, unnatural things, we must remember that these people are not our enemies. That behind them there's a dark spiritual presence. That there is an evil at work behind the scenes manipulating them which they know nothing about. We must remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Behind this godless culture, behind the humanist, humanist secular thinking, there is darkness, there is evil, there is demonic forces at work. Our enemies are not the flesh and blood people before us, but it is the spirit which, of the age, the spirit which leads them who are sons of, dis, of the disobedience. So we mustn't get that confused. And like it or not, when you became a Christian, you entered into this cosmic conflict. When you swore your allegiance to Christ, the king of Jerusalem, the true king, it put you at war with the king of Babylon. It put you at war with the people of this world and with the prince of darkness. Just as there was dark spiritual wickedness in Babylon, there's dark spiritual wickedness in our world. So we shouldn't be surprised when we feel sometimes like we're in a battle of like we're swimming against the tide because we actually are. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised, as Peter said, at the fiery trial when it comes upon us. We have to pass through Babylon. We have to be in this world, but not of the world. It's not something you can avoid as a Christian. Those of you who know me well will know I'm a big fan of John Bunyan, of the Pilgrim's Progress. And they're Christian and fearful, they're on the way to the celestial city and they come to a town called Vanity Fair and it has everything to tantalise them, to trick them away and they have to go straight through the town. They look around it but there's no way except through. It's a bit like that story, we're going on a bear hunt. Do you remember that one as children? It says you can't go under it, you can't go over it, you've got to go through it. 
It's the same with Babylon. It's the same with this world. We have to go forward to arrive at the kingdom of God. We have to go through this world and not be defiled by this world. It's a, it's a terrible thing in some ways, isn't it? But Christ is with us. He promises his help. He promises his encouragement. So we shouldn't be at all surprised when we pass through the city of Babylon that there's people who hate us, there's people who don't like the gospel message, and there's people who want to stop us. Uh, Jesus said, do not be surprised when the world hurts you. Just know that it hated me first. So, so just as um, the people in Babylon, the people of God were called to be in Babylon, but not of Babylon, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Now let me show you one more thing which we'll just see in these two verses. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this story, isn't there? Uh, let me ask you a question. As you look at this story, as you look at God's people in exile, whose hands are they in? Whose hand are they in? And there's two ways of answering. You could say they're in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the evil Babylonian king. I'm sure that's how they felt, isn't it, every day? when they felt his torment, you know, he even put rings in some of their noses and hooks and dragged them to Babylon. I'm sure they felt very much like they were in his hands, like they were given over to his will. But the reality is, the bigger picture is that even if Nebuchadnezzar has hold of them, the hand of God holds Nebuchadnezzar as well. And he is not going to let his people be lost we know the end from the beginning. We know that God's people survive Babylon. It's true for Israel then. It will be true for us today. He will keep us until the end. Because we serve the God of Daniel, the God who knows mysteries, the God who is all sovereign, who is all powerful. As it says in Psalm 12, he will keep us from this generation. If you've committed himself to you, he will keep you. He will preserve his saints. Because God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved, says Psalm 45. So the book of Daniel, you're going to see this glorious God keeping his people, keeping Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego as they walk into the flames. And that's really a picture of the sustaining hand of God. We're called to walk into the fiery trials of this life, but our God promises to be with her, to promise us to be with us. And though it happens in the enemy's backyard, though he tries to take dominion over this world, it truly belongs to God. And eventually the light will triumph over the darkness. So this is where the, the whole scope of history is heading. There's two kingdoms which collide, collide with each other. There's two people groups and there's a God who will keep his people safe. We're marching to Zion, as the old hymn says, through Babylon, through Babylon. And as God preserves us in that place, there was an old song by Johnny Cash, and it said about the men who walked through Babylon, it said, they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. And with God's help, that can be our testimony too, can't it? That we don't bend to the culture, we don't bend to the people of this world, we don't bow down to them, we don't worship Caesar, and we don't burn at the end of time, just like they didn't burn in the fire. So we know the story, and the book of Daniel helps us to live in this time of tribulation, this in-between time, in the already and the not yet. Let me just ask us a few questions as we close this evening. Uh, we've looked this evening at both the history and the theology of the exile, the human ex explanation and the divine reality. Now, let me ask you, when you look at your own life, how do you tend to make sense of your circumstances? Do you look only for the human ex explanation? Do you think I'm here because I did this or didn't do this? for the so-called natural circumstances which have led to this moment? Or do you look beyond it to the sovereign God? Or do you know that God's working all things together for your good, the one who upholds the world by his power? Are you trusting in God's sovereignty this evening? Or do you know that God planned for you to be sat here right this moment and that you're never truly outside of his will?
He is sovereign. He is keeping his people. Is this how we view life? Or like the world around us, do we go to our own explanations, our own way of seeing things? Let me ask you today, Christians, do you know that you're exiles in this world? And that you're pilgrims on a road to another country? And that you're an alien and a stranger in this land? That earth is not your home? If all this is true, then don't be surprised when you feel it. Don't be surprised when you feel out of place. Don't be surprised when they persecute you and they laugh at you and they ridicule you for following Christ. Are you living as an exile? Are you living as one who's just passing through? Or like the children of Israel, are you becoming distracted? Are you looking to the things of this world to satisfy you? I've used this illustration before, but it's a bit like a man who goes to a hotel and he gets the paint and the wallpaper out and he starts making the hotel beautiful, forgetting that he's only spending the night there. He's not, he's not got his priorities straight. He's just passing through. Do you know that you're just passing through and you're seeking to, to live that out in your daily life, seeking to put your priorities as eternal priorities? Because it's better to walk through this world like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego than to walk through it like Nebuchadnezzar. It's better to be a servant, a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be a king on the throne of wickedness. God calls us to be like Daniel, doesn't he? To go against the grain, to seek a city whose builder and maker is God. And finally, brothers and sisters, just to encourage you, are you reminding yourself of the final victory of Christ the final victory of the city of Jerusalem over the city of Babylon. You see, in the gospel, the death blow was already given, wasn't it? Satan lost a terrible, terrible loss when Christ rose from the dead. And there's coming a day in Revelation 19 when his kingdom will be stripped away in a single hour. Revelation 19 says, Fall and fall and is Babylon the great. And it's become a haunt for every detestable bird. A, a, a place for every foul and disgusting thing. It will be judged. The people of this world will be judged. The world system will be judged. But will shine forever in the kingdom of our Father in the new Jerusalem. Not because we were worthy, not because we did it all right, but because Christ died for us and rose again. Are you letting the good news of the gospel encourage you in your exile? You're thinking, yes, I'm at, I'm at war, but I know that we've already won. I know that I can't ultimately be lost. I know I can't ultimately die because Christ has died and risen in my place. So we have much to celebrate. We are marching to Zion through Babylon, but God promises to be with us. So as we look at Daniel together, I hope that God will stir us up. He'll show us how we, how we can live the time of our exile in fear, as Peter says, and because we know that God has already put his love upon us. Amen.